Okay, well, we have touched on the deliver, delivery methods before, but I wanted to go over this one more time. By definition, delivery, as far as public speaking goes, is going to, to mainly be defined by the verbal and nonverbal behaviors you use to perform your speech. So delivery is not just the verbal aspect of it, but it's also the nonverbal behaviors as well. There are four different, primarily four different types of delivery as far as public speaking goes, and that's going to be manuscript delivery. Basically, that is just reading your speech. This is used with teleprompters. I've previously discussed how award shows often do this, or when the president gives you the State of the Union address, he is using a teleprompter as well. Memorized delivery is going to be giving a speech you learned word for word, and this is not something that we recommend because if if you forget just one word of that, you're going to forget your entire speech, and you're just going to freeze up, so we always want to avoid that memorized delivery. The next version is, or the next type of delivery is going to be impromptu delivery, and that's going to be presenting the speech pretty much as you create it. You rarely have too much time to develop your ideas or, or work to to really prepare your ideas. So with impromptu delivery though, it is something we do use quite often. For instance, in our careers, we might be called on to give an update on a certain project or something along those lines in a meeting. And often that's gonna be an impromptu delivery if you weren't warned in advance that, that you would be doing that update. And then we have extemporaneous delivery. And that delivery is what we use in this public speaking course because it's the one that's that's the most adaptable to most situations. And that's going to be preparing and rehearsing a speech carefully in advance, but choosing the exact wording as we deliver the speech. And we've talked about with extemporaneous delivery that we construct our speech well in advance. We construct our main points and our supporting materials in there. We work to create a outline for our speech, and then we take the outline and we transform that into a keyword outline, also known as a speaking outline, to put onto our note cards. And that speaking outline or that keyword outline, either way you want to, either either term you want to use for that, is used to actually deliver your speech. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Designing a speech requires strategic organization. And with that, I mean strategic organization is just putting a speech together in a particular way to achieve a particular result with a particular audience. That's very particular, isn't it? So we want to make sure that we are putting together the speech in a way that both achieves the exact results we're looking to achieve and also targeting the exact audience we're hoping to target there. Now, the process of organizing the body of the speech begins when we determine what our main points are going to be. And don't forget that we've went over this before, but main points are the major points developed in the body of a speech, and most speeches contain two to five main points. Now, we want to make sure that we're only, we only have about two to five main points because anything less than that, and well, you know, you won't have enough to talk about probably, but anything more than that, and you probably have too much content to cover in the amount of time you've been given for your speech. So when we have too much information, we're not fully going into each point. We're basically just listing the main point and moving on. We're not providing enough of the supporting materials that we need to fully address that main point. So two to five is what we should have in our speeches. Main points are the central features of your speech. So you want to select them carefully. You want to phrase them precisely. And you want to arrange them strategically. And we'll talk about that in quite detail in this lecture. Okay, so I wanted to give you an example of main points in a speech. And, of course, this isn't, you know, all that your outline would encompass. Of course not. But this kind of gives you an idea of what main points might be. Now, let's say that the general purpose of this speech was to inform. This specific purpose was to inform my audience about some of the major uses of hypnosis. And the central idea, idea here, and I want you to pay attention to that first couple of words of this sentence. The central idea, also known as the thesis statement, could be this. Three major uses of hypnosis today are to control pain and surgery, to help people stop smoking, and to help students improve their academic performance. Okay, well, let's look at that central idea. That central idea, as we know, is one single statement that encompasses what we are addressing in our speech. And if you look at the very first three words of that central idea, it says the three main uses. Well, that lets us know that we're going to have three main points to form the skeleton of the body of our speech. 
If there are obviously three major uses of hypnosis, then logically there can be three main points in the speech, right? So the main points of the speech might be, as we've taken from our central idea there, hypnosis is used in surgery as an adjunct to chemical uh, anesthesia. Second main point might be hypnosis is used to help people stop smoking. And the third major, excuse me, third main point might be hypnosis is used to help students improve their academic performance. And you'll see that I pretty much just took that straight from that central idea statement of what I, I'm addressing in my speech. So that's a great example of main points being constructed in an outline to form the skeleton of the body of the speech. Okay, so once you decide your main points, you need to decide then the order in which you want to present those main points. Well, how do you do that? Well, it actually depends on a few things. It's going to depend on your topic that you've chosen. It's going to depend on the purpose that you are trying to, to do in this speech and also your audience. And there are actually five basic patterns of organization used in, in these speeches that we create. The first is going to be, the first basic pattern of organization that we might use in a speech would be possibly chronological order. And with chronological order, it is a method of speech organization in which the main points flow a time, or excuse me, follow a time pattern. And I'm going to give you an example of all of these in a second. So, you know, just kind of keep these things in mind, and we'll go back and forth between the slides so that I know that you're understanding exactly what I'm, I'm describing for you. So chronological order is a method of speech organization in which the main points follow a time pattern. Now, spatial order is a pattern of organization in which it, um, well, it's a method of speech organization in which the main points follow a directional pattern. Causal order is a method of speech organization in which the main points show a cause-effect relationship. Problem-solution order is a method of speech organization in which the first main point deals with the existence of a problem, and the second main point presents a solution to that problem. And topical order is a method of speech organization in which the main points divide the topic into logical and consistent subtopics. Now, let's go over these things and give you some examples so that you can really understand what I mean here. All right, so we previously said that chronological order was, or, or is better, a method of speech organization in which the main points follow a time pattern. So let's take a look at this, this example. If it's following a time pattern, the general purpose of this speech would be to inform the specific purpose would be to inform my audience how the Great Wall of China was built. The central idea could be the Great Wall of China was built in three major stages. Now remember, three major stages tells me that I'm going to have what? Three main points. Okay? Now, I want to make this a, a quick uh, note here, though. Just because I say that we're having three main points, that doesn't mean that you're only going to have three Roman numerals in your outline. Of course, you'd have a Roman numeral for your introduction, You'd have the three for your main points, and then you'd have a, another Roman numeral, which here would be Roman numeral five for your conclusion. So Roman numeral one in your outline would be for your introduction. Roman numeral here, at least, would be uh, two, three, and four would be for these three main points we're going to present, and then Roman numeral five would be for your conclusion. Uh, you, that differs depending on how many main points you have, and you know, a lot of other different things. So it's not going to be one set number of Roman numerals for your outline. It just depends. If you have two main points, well, that's going to change. If you have three main points, it's going to change. If you have four or five main points, it's going to change. You'll never have more than five main points, though. Don't forget about that. Okay, so chronolo back to the chronological order. Well, if we said that chronological order is a method of speech organization in which the main points follow a time pattern, we can look at the main points here and see that it follows a time pattern. You know, we've got building of the Great Wall between, uh, began during the, uh, you know, the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm hoping that I'm quoting this correctly, but the Qin Dynasty of 221 to 206 B.C., 
The next one would, again, follow that, that time pattern order, and that's going to be new sections of the Great Wall were added during the Han Dynasty of 206 BC to 220 AD, and then the Great Wall was completed during the Ming Dynasty of 1368 to 1644. So we can see how we have a progression of time here, and that's going to be chronological order. Okay, the next one I'm going to discuss is spatial order. And spatial order is a method of speech organization in which the main points follow a directional pattern. So we're talking about directional patterns now. So let's say our general purpose is to inform. The specific purpose is to inform my audience about the structure of a hurricane, something we're very familiar with in my area of the world. And then the central idea would be a hurricane is made up of three parts, again, telling us how many main points, three parts going from inside to outside. So the main points here are going to follow a directional pattern. At the center direction, the center of a hurricane is the calm, cloud-free eye. Second main point, surrounding the eye, again moving in a directional pattern, is the eye wall, a dense ring of clouds that produces the most intense wind and rainfall. Then the third main point, rotating around the eye wall, again, we're following a direction. It's kind of pulling us out from the eye of the hurricane, um, out in a, in, a, in a directional pattern. Rotating around the eye wall are three bands of clouds and excuse me, precipitation called spiral rain bands. So again, we're following a directional pattern here. Okay, the next order we're going to talk about is causal order. And that is a method of speech organization in which the main points show a cause-effect pattern. So when we think causal order, we want to remember a cause-effect. Okay, so let's go to causal order. Here's an example. General purpose, to persuade. Specific purpose is to persuade my audience that a growing shortage of qualified air traffic controllers is a serious problem for U.S. aviation. Central idea, the growing shortage of certified air traffic controllers threatens the safety of air travel. Okay, so our main points here, we have just two main points that we're going to make in this speech, and that is going to be the U.S. aviation system faces a growing shortage of qualified air traffic controllers. Okay, think in terms of cause and effect. And then the second main point is, if this shortage continues, it will, so cause, if this shortage continues, effect. It will create serious problems for airline safety. Okay, so cause-effect relationship there. Now the next one I want to talk about is problem solution order. And that's going to be a method of speech organization in which the first main point deals with the existence of a problem and then the second main point presents a solution to that problem. So let's look at problem solution. General purpose is to persuade specific purpose to persuade my audience that action is needed to combat the abuses of puppy mills. Central idea, puppy mills are a serious problem that can be solved by a combination of a legislation and individual initiative. Okay, we have two main points here. So remember, problem presented, solution then presented. Pro uh, excuse me, first main point. Puppy mills are a serious problem across the United States. Problem. Next main point, solving the problem requires legislation and individual initiative, solution. Okay, we see how that works there. The last one I want to talk about is topical order. And topical order <clears throat> is a method of speech organization in which the main points divide the topic into logical and consistent subtopics. All right, let's take a look at topical order. Okay, general purpose to inform, specific purpose to inform my audience about the achievements of Josephine Baker. Central idea, Josephine Baker was a multi-talented figure in the fight for racial justice. Here are our main points. And again, remember that with topic, topical order, we are looking for, um, we are Taking those main points, and we divide the topic into logical and consistent subtopics. So let's take a look at topical order. First main point, as an entertainer, Baker captivated audiences in Europe and America. Okay, we're dividing up into those, those subtopics to make a logical and consistent manner here. As a spy, Baker gathered information on Nazi activities in France during World War II. As a civil rights activist, Baker worked for racial equality on a variety of fronts. 
okay all right so that is going to cover right there is going to be the five basic patterns of organization all right okay so tips for for preparing your main points each main point should be clearly independent of another one okay i want to give you an ineffective example first and then give you an effective one because i think that that will help you to see what's wrong with these things and how it could be corrected so each main point needs to be clearly independent of others here's one that's ineffective the first steps or excuse me the first step it should say the first step is to choose the play and select a cast well that is not having that's, that's two two main points in one statement we don't want to do that so what we want to do is for the first main point we would say the first step is to choose the play and then the second main point would be the second step is to choose the cast so we want to make sure that we're breaking those up into two two main points and not just one so that the main points are clearly independent of each other next tip would be to try to use the same pattern of wording for your main points Here's an ineffective example. Karate gives you better mental discipline. First main point. Second main point. You will become physically stronger through karate. Now remember, to be effective, we want to try to use the same pattern of wording for each main point. Here's a, here's a more effective example. Karate improves your mental discipline. Second main point. Karate increases your physical strength. So you see why, how we have a pattern of wording there? That helps it to just be a bit more effective. We also want to balance the amount of time devoted to main points. Because your main points are so important, you want to make sure that you are giving enough time to clearly emphasize and be clear and convincing for each main point. So make sure that you allow sufficient time to develop each main point. Don't give 80% of your time to one, 10% of your time to another, and so forth. You want to make sure that you're giving enough time to each main point. So how do we connect our ideas? One common question that I often get from students is, okay, I know my main point. I know my supporting material. However, I'm not sure how to connect everything. Well, there's a great way to do that, and it's called connectives. Connectives are words, phrases, and sentences used to lead from idea to idea and tie the parts of the speech together in a smooth manner. And you'll hear me talk about flow in your speeches. Connectives help to give us a good flow. Okay, one type of connective is a signpost. And a signpost is a connective such as first or most importantly. And consequently, that links ideas, it lends emphasis, and it helps listeners to keep their place in the speech. So an example of a signpost would be, so first, to what extent will you be protected by wearing a seatbelt? So that first is a signpost there. Another example might be, my second point is, so that's a, that's a signpost. Another connective that we can use in speeches or that we should use in speeches is called transitions. And you'll e actually even call, hear me call these transition statements. So transitions, by definition, are a summary of where you've been and where you're going. An example of a transition statement would be, before we look for solutions to this problem, let's see what other countries have tried to do about it. So it connects the main points in your speech in a way that you have a good flow there. Internal previews are a statement in the body of the speech that lets the audience know what the speaker is going to discuss next. And these are often combined with transitions to really provide some great flow there. And here's an example of how you could use a transition with an internal preview to really just connect your ideas. Okay, now that we have seen, this is the transition first, now that we have seen how serious the problem of faulty credit reporting is, let's look at some solutions. That's your transition, and then you go into the internal preview. I will focus on three solutions. Instituting tighter government regulation of credit bureaus, holding credit bureaus financially responsible for their errors, and giving individuals easier access to the credit report. So that provides that, that great flow that tells us what we're going to do next. Okay, another connective that we, we might choose to use in our speeches and probably should choose to use in our speeches is in, internal summaries. An internal summary, summary is a statement in the body of the speech that summarizes the speaker's preceding point or points. These are a great way to clarify and to reinforce ideas. And by, again, by combining these with transitions, 
you can also lend your audience smooth, or excuse me, lead your audience smoothly into your next main point. So it just helps with that flow. Here's an example where we first we first introduce the internal summary, and then we have the transition at the end. So it's a little bit backwards from the one we just did. First internal summary. Let's pause for a moment to summarize what we have found so far. First, we have seen the keeping that keeping killer whales in captivity stunts their mental and physical development. Second, we've seen that keeping killer whales in captivity endangers other animals and human trainers. Now we have the transition. We are now in a position to see what can be done to keep killer whales out of captivity. So those can be great ways, connectives are great ways to improve the flow of your speech. Something that all speakers should work to incorporate in their speeches. All right, so let's flip gears for a minute and really focus a bit more on outline. In a speech outline, you want to make sure that each main point is identified by a Roman numeral. Now, again, I want to state that, first off, you need to follow the sample outlines in the course. Those will greatly help you. With every outline, you want to include your general purpose, your specific purpose, and your either central idea or thesis statement, either way you want to call it. From there, your first Roman numeral will be for your introduction. Okay. Then you'll have your next following Roman numerals will be for your main points, for each main point that you're going to make, somewhere between two to five main points. And then the last Roman numeral in your outline will be for your conclusion section. Just a few tips and, and, and food for thought to kind of make sure that you're doing this correctly. Each Roman numeral should have at least an A and a B underneath it, a capitalized A and B. And these letters are used for that supporting material that you're using to support the main point above it. If you need to elaborate further than the A and the B and you just need even more supporting material, you can include numbers underneath there. And I'm going to show you an example in a second. One, two, and so forth. But I like to remind my students that this follows a form of a buddy system. Okay? Don't forget the letters and numbers must have a buddy. So every A needs to have a B. And every one, and if used at least, every one must have a two. So every Roman numeral that you have is going to have a main point. Under that, you need to at least have an A and a B. Okay, you can't have an A without a B. It needs a buddy. Okay, and if you choose to elaborate beyond that point, those are the requirements, but if you choose to elaborate beyond that point, then you can use a one and a two. But again, it follows the buddy system. If you include a one, you must include a two. Okay. Here's a great example for you. Here's a sample outline that I am um, that I have included for, let's say, a wedding toast. So my general purpose here is to celebrate. My specific purpose is to celebrate the marriage of James and Jan. And my thesis statement could be: Today we come together to celebrate not only the friendship of two wonderful people, but also their lifelong union to each other. Okay. Now you'll see that my first Roman numeral here is for my introduction and it's going to say I'm going to for my attention getter use a quote it's not a lack of love but a lack of friendship that makes an unhappy marriage for my A I just kind of threw in a, a, a sentence there that kind of conjoined it all together for me this quote rings all too true my B is my preview of main points that's why today we're we are here to celebrate not only the love but the friendship of two people who are truly meant to be together. Okay, so that leads into the body of my speech. Roman numeral two is going to be the first main point I'm going to make. And I might describe how I met James as a child, and then I have my supporting material under there. James was the new kid in kindergarten. Uh, my B is who knew we would be become lifelong friends. And then I felt like since James and I were lifelong friends that I kind of needed to elaborate on that a little bit further. So that's why I included the one and in, in the two there. My first elaboration under that B is going to be our joke is that we've graduated four, almost five times together. And this is actually based on a real friendship that I have with uh, a gentleman. Of course, their name could have been changed. But um, I went to a very small school, and we graduated. James and I graduated kindergarten, sixth grade. Um, we graduated kindergarten, sixth grade, um, high school and our undergraduate together, and we almost caught up to each other on the master's degree, but not quite. So I was about one term after him on that one. So, you know, that's kind of a running joke that we have. And then the second elaboration I will discuss is we had a blast going to college together. Okay? 
then that leads me into my next main point. I met Jan at work. Uh, how I would support that, my supporting material here. And since this is a speech of a wedding toast, it's a speech of celebration, my supporting material is going to be a little bit different. That's going to be mainly testimony and examples. Of course, you wouldn't want to add in too much facts and statistics in this because it's not that type of speech. But in most of your speeches in this course, you will be using facts, statistics, testimony, examples, and so forth. But I would talk about how I met Jan at work. And my supporting material would be my first impression of Jan was that she was extremely shy. Boy, was I wrong. And then I might talk about my B there. I remember the first time James and Jan saw each other. Now, because this speech is for a wedding toast, it's not going to be a 10-minute speech. You know, I want to try to keep it short, and we're at the reception, and it's going to be a good time. So just kind of a little bit of here and there, and, and congratulations to the couple. So I only have two main points here. My first Roman numeral is for my introduction. Roman numeral two and three are for my two main points that I'm going to make. And that leads me to Roman numeral five, which is going to be my conclusion. And I might say, you know, years later, they met again by chance. Um, of course, I would give you a signpost that says, you know, to conclude, years, years later, they met again by chance. They saw each other, and they just instantly connected to each other. They were truly meant for each other. And of course, I would elaborate on all of this. This is just an outline. And then I would just talk about how he loves her beyond her beauty, and she just gets him. Oh, excuse me. I have another Roman numeral under there. So that would be... Roman numeral 1 is for your introduction. Roman numeral 2, 3, and 4 are my main points. Roman numeral 5 is for my conclusion. And then that's when I would get to my conclusion, and I would give you the signpost of in conclusion. I can honestly say that these two will make it because they have both love and friendship. Okay? So my restating of main points here is going to be a little different too because it's a wedding toast, but I would say, so let's make sure to celebrate the lives they have. Lives. So let's make sure to celebrate their lives together today and the friendship and love that they share. So I've kind of recapped the friendship and the love part of the speech. And then my B would be, so raise your glass to the happy couple. May they be, they be blessed by many wonderful years together and just have nothing but happiness in their life. Okay, so that's pretty much it. You know, that is how you design the speech, how you design the outline, and how you execute it. Um, of course, if I was going to do the speech, I would do it a lot better for you, but you understand the gist of it there. Okay, so a few speaking notes. When you construct this outline, you want to make sure that you then create a keyword outline for your note card. So we're going to talk about that in a second. But you're going to use use or you're going to use keywords for your points on your note cards. Keywords are important words and phrases that will jog the speaker's memory. You should, and I'm going to give you an example of that in just a moment. You should always create a keyword outline. This is also called a speaking outline based off of your speech outline to use on your note cards. Now, for your note cards, it's always a good idea to use index cards that are probably either 4 by 6 or 3 by 5 You don't want those giant billboard-looking ones because they're very distracting. And you don't want big, giant sheets of paper up there either because that's very distracting as well. Now, on your note cards, always make sure to write legibly and give yourself plenty of room. Remember only keywords, only that speaking outline on those note cards because that will keep you from reading your speech. You want to number your note cards. Now, this is something that students forget a lot, but if you number your note cards front and back, let's say for some reason you get to the podium and you, you, your organization of your note cards just becomes, um, gets messed up, well, you have them numbered so you can kind of check them and reorganize them real quick. And I've had students that have accidentally dropped them or so forth. And it just allows you to pick them up and not panic. You can go, okay, they're numbered. I'll just stick them right back together where they were. Delete non-essential words. Remember, you should only be using a speaking outline or keyword outline on those note cards. Some students choose to highlight areas and write in needed items like, you know, make gestures here, emphasize or pause on this. Um, you don't have to do that, but it does help with a lot of students on their delivery. You always want to make sure that you practice in front of a mirror and you can practice on other people. And don't read unless it's a direct quote. If you're directly quoting something, you want to make sure to get that quote right. So it's okay to read that off, but then continue your eye contact back to the audience. And don't do that too often. Here's an example of a keyword outline, again, also called a speaking outline. Keyword outlines are like I said, called speaking outlines, and this is what you're going to use on your note cards. And here's an example. The topic of this, this speech might be or would be history of the U.S. women's rights movement. 
And you'll see here, I'm not going to read all this off to you because you can see it, but you'll see that it's just keywords, keywords, keywords. That's it. There's no long sentences. You know, you save that for your actual outline. Keyword outline just jogs your memory. You would look down and see um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and you would remember what you were going to talk about with her. And you can include a bit more if you need to, but this is pretty much what it would look like. Mannerisms and vocal variety when you deliver your speech. You want to make sure that you control your gestures. For some reason, students think that gestures are a bad thing. Gestures are always encouraged in your speech. Just controlled, meaningful movements. The best speakers give some form of gestures, unless you're, for instance, a news anchor. Of course, you wouldn't do it then. But gestures are encouraged in public speaking. They make your speech more dynamic and they help to keep the audience's attention. You also want to make sure that you're making eye contact. We're going to talk about that at a later date, but I want to talk about one thing really quickly. A lot of times students give a tip on eye contact by saying, you know, I, I find a focal point in the back of the room and I stare at that the entire time I deliver my speech. Or another what I hear is, well, I make sure to stare at the speaker's forehead, I mean, excuse me, at the audience member's foreheads instead of making eye contact because the eye contact makes me nervous. And when I stare at their foreheads, they don't know the difference. And I think I've mentioned this in a previous meeting. Try that out next time you talk to someone. Try staring at their forehead while you talk or, or finding a focal point at the back of the room. Eventually, you'll find them asking you, what are you looking at? Or better yet, them turning around trying to figure out what you're looking at. Because people know when you don't make eye contact with them. It's very important to just get used to making that eye contact with people because that is a vital part of the strict speech process. You also want to try to avoid fidgeting. By fidgeting, I mean touching your hair, touching your face, tapping your, your shoe, playing with a necklace or a ring. Anything that's not a meaningful movement, we want to try to cut it out. We also want to work on clear pronunciation and articulation of our words. And we want to use, use vocal variations. Vocal variations are changes in volume, rate, and pitch that combine to create impressions of the speaker. We want to work to try to, we want to try, excuse me, we want to work to try unfilled pauses here and there when they're needed, you know, not too many of them and not, definitely not too long. But the unfilled pauses help us to avoid verbal fillers. And an example of a verbal filler is um or uh or so, and, and sometimes we'll hear er, people kind of do things like that. We want to work to avoid that. That's very distracting. So try those unfilled pauses here and there only when you need to because a lot of times we use the ums and uhs because we're gathering our thoughts for a minute and we just need a little bit of time to think about what we're going to say next. So it's okay to use an unfilled pause here and there. Nothing too long, only a second or two just to get us back on track and then, and then start again. And of course we also want to include enthusiasm. You know, of course, that depends on the topic. If we're talking about the topic of heart disease or cancer, well, we don't want to be enthusiastic on that. But if we're talking about how to bake your world-famous chocolate chip cookies, should be a little bit of enthusiasm in that. It's your world-famous chocolate chip cookies, after all. We want to work on volume and rate. We're going to talk about what this really entails a little bit later in the class. But with volume, when you're delivering your speech to an audience, you're going to be speaking a little bit louder than you would in a conversation with someone because you really want to project your voice so that people in the back of the room can hear you. As far as the rate goes, generally speakers are speaking too fast. I don't think I've ever encountered, encountered one that I said, hey, speed up. Rate is often an issue in terms of speaking too quickly. So we want to make sure that we are speaking at a rate that people can really take in the information we're giving them and we're not rushing through it. And sometimes we have a tendency to rush through that information because we just want to get it over with and sit down. But try to try to avoid that by just concentrating on your rate here and there and making sure that you're speaking at a rate that people can understand you clearly and are able to process your wonderful ideas. We also want to work on controlling that anxiety like I've talked about in previous lectures. And we can do that by using controlled movements. We talked about how controlled movements can help us to release that extra adrenaline we have, which will help us to better control that anxious feeling and the anxious side effects we sometimes 
experience such as trembling and shaking and so forth. Never, ever, ever tell us that you're nervous or apologize, okay? I, I, I'm always just astounded by the students that will say, I'm so sorry, I didn't have enough time to prepare for this, but I'm going to give it a shot. Why would you tell your audience that? You never tell them that. I hope you do prepare for your speeches and and never tell us anything like that. And and never start off your speech with, "Oh, I'm so nervous, but, you know, I know I know this is what I have to do." Or you don't ever tell us anything like that. We're your audience. We're here to listen to your speech and that's it. Remember that nervousness can be seen as a good thing. We've already talked about that, but it can be seen as passionate about your topic. So, turn that nervous energy into positive nervousness. And be confident in yourself, your ideas, and your topic. You are worthy of being heard, and we just can't wait to hear what you have to say because you are a responsible speaker, and you possess responsible knowledge, and we know that. And always remember this in speech design. But like I said, you're going to have an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. In the introduction, you're going to have the attention getter. Remember that stories, quotes, questions, facts, statistics work well for an attention getter, any of those things. And then you're going to preview the main points of your speech, which is basically where you tell us what you're going to talk about. Then you're going to go to the body of the speech. You're going to take those main points you previewed. You're going to dissect them into main points and supporting material, main points and supporting material. Then you're going to get to the conclusion of your speech. First, you're going to give us a signpost, a simple in conclusion to conclude, just something to let us know that you're nearing the very end of your speech. You're going to restate your main points, tell us what you told us. You're going to end with a memorable statement or a clincher. And that's going to be, again, a, a story, a quote, a question, a fact, a statistic, something that helps us to have psychological closure to your speech. People that don't design conclusions properly are the individuals that usually have to say if they feel like they need to say at the end of the speech. Yeah, and that's it. That's, that's all I've got. Well, that's because you didn't design your conclusion well and people were in limbo. They didn't know if the speech was finished or not. So we want to make sure that we design it in this manner and never say, and that's it. That's all I've got at the end of your speech. Just end it with your clincher, your memorable statement, whatever you want to call it. That's it. Nothing more is needed. Now, I will say, though, we'll talk about this at a later point in the class, but in the business setting, in your career setting, there will be times where you might want to do a, a question and answer session afterwards. Not in this course. I, I do not want you to use question and answer sessions um, at the end of your speeches in this course. But in your career world, you very well might. And that's the only time that after your memorable statement or your clincher, whatever you want to call it, that you can say something else. And that would be, does anybody have any questions or comments? You know, something like that. Otherwise, we're just going to end it right there at this class. So planning the introduction. I've talked about the ways that we can plan the introduction. I've talked about how an introduction needs to first begin with, no, not hi, my name is. And today I'm going to talk about never start a speech like that. It needs to, the first thing that comes out of your mouth needs to be story, Quote, a question, either participatory or rhetorical, a fact or a statistic. Then after that, we want to preview our main points. But how do we gain the speaker's attention and interest in this? Okay, we never want to just ask any old question or give any old quote. We want to make sure that we're gaining their attention and keeping their interest from the get-go. Well, one way we can do that is relate the topic to the audience. And you might start off by saying, through your attention getter, or attention grabber, either one, they're interchangeable. You might want to relate the topic to your audience by saying, it's Saturday morning and you're helping clean out your grandmother's attic. After working a while, you stumble upon a trunk, open it, and discover hundreds of old postcards. Thinking about getting to the football game on time, you start tossing the cards into the trash can. Congratulations, you've just thrown away a year's tuition. That's a way to relate the topic to the audience. It's, it's giving them a kind of a preview of something that they might very well do. Another way to gain the speaker's, uh, another way to gain the audience's attention or interest is to state the importance of your topic. And here's a good example for that. There are 3.9 million kids growing up in this country in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty. That's two and a half times the entire population of Manhattan. No matter how hard they work in school, no matter what their parents do to try to get ahead, the single biggest predictor of their life chances 
even their lifespan is the zip code they grow up in. So that states the importance of your topic. And you see I'm really stressing those words there and, and putting emphasis in that. And that will help to keep the audience's attention as well. Another way to keep their attention and really keep their interest is to startle the audience in some way. But I did want to add this on there. Don't be too extreme with startling your audience. I've had that go very badly with some students. So make sure that you're really thinking about what you're doing here. But here's a good example. Take a moment and think about the three women closest to you. Who comes to mind? Your mother, your sister, your girlfriend, your wife. Now guess which one of those women will be sexually assaulted during her lifetime. It's not a pleasant thought, but according to the United States Department of Justice, one of every three American women will be sexually assaulted sometime during her life. Okay, it's not very extreme, but it's very startling because if you think about that, you know, you're thinking about personally about that and you go, oh my gosh, that is a strong statistic. And I want to point out one thing here as well. It says, but according to the United States Department of Justice, that's a verbal citation and that's how we include research in our speeches. Now, another way to gain the attention of the audience and to really keep them interested is to arouse the curiosity of the audience. And you can do that by, and here's a good example. It's the most common chronic disease in the United States. Controllable but incurable. It is a symptomless disease. You can have it for years and never know it until it almost kills you. Some 73 million Americans have this disease and 300,000 will die from it before the year is out. Odds are that five of us in this audience will have it. What am I talking about? Not cancer, not AIDS, not even heart disease. I'm talking about hypertension, high blood pressure. So that's a way to arouse the curiosity of the audience and really hook them into that speech so that they want to listen. And the last way we can do this is question the audience. We could do that with a really simple um, rhetorical question or even a participatory question. Here's a good rhetorical question example, though. Have you ever spent a sleepless night studying for an exam? Can you remember rushing to finish a term paper because you waited too long to start writing it? Do you often feel overwhelmed by all the things you have to get done at school, at work, or even at home? If so, you may be the victim of poor time management. Fortunately, there are proven strategies that you can follow to use your time more efficiently and to keep control of your life. That's a rhetorical example. And it's rhetorical because the questions we're asking are not asking the audience to participate by a show of hands or something like that. They're just asking us uh, to mull things over in our mind, so to speak. So a participatory example could be something along those lines, these lines. And of course, you'd want to design it a, a lot more like the rhetorical example, but I wanted to keep it simple here so you understood. A participatory example might be, by a show of hands, how many people in the room are registered voters? You might actually want to follow that up with a really good fact about how many people are actually registered voters, how many people actually vote, and so forth, you know. But that gives you a good example. We're saying by a show of hands, we're asking for participation there. And another good way is to tell a story. Telling a story can help us to also gain the attention of the audience and sustain that interest. And I'm not going to tell you a story here because of lack of time, but if you remember from previous the previous lecture I did, I gave you the example of the narrative about how I had to perform the infant Heimlich maneuver and how I was very glad that I was able to know how to do this and how I saved a life in doing so. So that could be a great way to open the speech as well. It really stressed the importance of why learning this is, is important for the listeners. And the conclusion, you know, keep it simple. You want to signal the end of the speech with a signpost in conclusion or to conclude or something along those lines and a statement. You want to restate your main points. Why do we restate the main points? Well, because we want the listener to retain that information. And when we take the time to restate our main points, that's why today we talked about whatever it is. Um, then it helps to solidify that in their mind and helps them to retain that information better. And then we want to end with a memorable statement also called a clincher. And again, that can be a story, a quote, question, fact, or statistic. Think about these in terms of the attention grabber. It's just used at the end of the speech instead. 
All right, so that about wraps up our lecture for this week. If you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out to me in the course. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Otherwise, you guys are doing amazing, so just keep up the hard work, and I hope this lecture helped you to better understand how to outline and organize your speech and so much more. Thanks, guys.